So thanks to your uh, stage of the course, uh, as you just heard, we're the final session tonight. And we do appreciate that we are stood between you and cocktails. So, um, <laughs> but I know it's going to be really interesting. You know, this plenary session is about sort of really how do we scale up impact? And I really feel like Kiva is the poster child of that. Um, and so I'm thrilled to be sat here with CEO of Kiva, Neville Crawley. Uh, from San Francisco himself, um, as is Kiva. Um, so, uh, so, those of you who aren't familiar with Kiva, um, it was set up in 2005. Um, it's a crowdfunding platform that moves finance towards microloans for individuals, um, entrepreneurs, you know, including refugees, uh, smallholders, um, and women, many of the, you know, the, the themes we've been talking about here at SOCAP, um, chiefly in developing countries where interest rates are really crippling otherwise. Um, and it's moved $1.4 billion in capital over that period, which is just incredible. And one billion of that has been to women. So already such an incredible impact has been made, um, which you think might be enough, except um, Neville uh, was brought on two years ago chiefly with the mandate to take that impact even further. Um, and uh, during these two years, um, he has done just that to, you know, to what has sort of resulted in a systems change, um, which really is the sort of fullest expression of impact there is. And I think it's something as an impact investment community that we shy away from talking about, like how do we get to system change? And I know the panel, panelists before us have talked a little bit about that. Um, so I think sort of, you know, to start with, um, it would be helpful, um, some of you may be sort of starting out yourselves of sort of examining how you can have more impact to hear from Neville about, who had a very different background to a non-profit before he joined Kiva, about what he saw in Kiva, uh, what you saw in Kiva, that gave you the confidence that um, impact could really be scaled up. Thank you so much. And uh, rarely am I called a poster child, so I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to be sat here as a poster child. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I said I joined Kiva a couple of years ago, and. I've done various things in finance and technology, always in the private sector, and directly before Kiva, I was building quantitative trading algorithms at hedge fund, so I like, couldn't, be, couldn't be further away. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, met, I met the board chair of Kiva, and you know, I knew the brand, I was always very impressed by the brand, but over, over this lunch, I, I understood that, I understood really for the first time, there are a couple of billion people in the world who don't have access to finance, there are a billion people who don't even have identity, and that they're paying 30, 50, in some cases, 100% interest rates. Me meanwhile, Kiva has, the Kiva data is that our, our loss rate is 2 to 3% to the same population. So I'm like, wait, trillions of dollars needs to move to these folks who have a better repayment rate than US credit card, <laughs> and there's like a 50% plus spread. Meanwhile, I'm writing like the most complex algorithms ever to make one basis point. Like there's something fundamentally wrong about this. <laughs> and, uh, and I just couldn't get that thought, thought out of my mind that, from a, that this is like a solvable problem. You know what I mean? There are problems that are not solvable, but like big asset classes with really big interest spreads, in general, that's a solvable problem. And so I just couldn't figure out like, why is the system like this? It shouldn't be like this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you solved it. Uh, well, no, <laughs> so, no, no. so you moved to what's effectively known as like, you know, internally Kiva 2.0, um, and over the last two years, it's been sort of kind of full steam ahead. You've got Kiva Capital and Kiva Protocol now. So maybe you can just talk us through how that journey began, sort of just um, and you know, sort of highlight some of the major changes around impact that have happened in that short period. Oh sure, yeah. So so I joined I joined Kiva CEO and. Um, Immediately, instead of running the organization, I, I just went off and went to visit our borrowers and visit our financial partners for several months, which I'm sure was quite distressing for the uh, board of directors there and possibly for employees too. But, um, but I, I really didn't know the answer to the problem. So I just wanted to go sit with people, sit with people earning a few dollars a day, sit with the financial institutions that are serving them and, and try to understand. And I, I really... I really learned three things which has become the portfolio of things we're doing at Kiva right now. One is that the crowdfunding dollars, you know, we deploy, we've deployed $1.4 billion over time, we deploy about $150 million a year, um, but we could, we could 10x that and there's market demand for it. And, and the reason that there's market demand is we're providing 
zero or very close to zero percent capital where the crowd will absorb the loss. So we can go to uh, MFI or a social enterprise and say, hey, you serve this market segment, we think there's this other servable market segment and we will provide the cheapest, most risk tolerant capital in the world for you to explore that segment. And so we've catalyzed refugee lending for lenders who, who haven't lent there before. We've lent to border regions, all, all of this kind of the edge of impact stuff that we can do because of the unique nature of the capital. So that kind of was very clear, if we can get as much money out as we can kind of get our hands on, then the problem comes about money in. And so we're building new mobile apps, we're making a bunch of changes to the site. So we really just, it's kind of a quite straightforward, let's make it a attractive consumer internet proposition that people want to come to, so that's one. Second question is they're sitting with the financial institutions and the social enterprises. Real simple questions like, like, we provide capital like this, you've done these refugee loans, if I could give you, you know, five million bucks at some reasonable interest rate to scale that up, are you interested? And, and every single financial institution that I spoke with and social enterprise said, yeah, we would love to take price capital from Kiva to scale up the impact. And so from that came, came this idea of Kiva Capital. We're launching our, our first fund in the coming months, which will be a refugee-focused fund. And the, the basis behind that fund is that we proved with $15 million of crowdfunding platforms that in the markets we operate, and we operate in 90 countries in the world, the refugees have basically the exact same repayment rate as regular population, and yet they get a fraction of the dollars. So it's just a fundamental market inefficiency that we were able to prove with data is incorrect. It's actually a market inefficiency, and so now we're raising um, wholesale funding from institutional um, sources to go scale up where we've proven that the money is going to get repaid, and we expect to do a series of thematic funds around women's empowerment, ag, like a whole bunch of impact areas. But the interesting thing for Kiva is because we have a part, we've worked with 500 financial institutions around the world, that we have a network so we can slice and dice impact in a very bespoke way, and we can deploy capital in places we have a track record and we know them well. So I think we have the opportunity to scale up to be a substantial um, impact first asset manager there over time. And then the third thing that maybe we'll get onto a bit more is actually a even if we deploy several billion dollars like this over the coming years, it doesn't change the system. Right? There's still going to be a billion people with no identity. There's still going to be a couple of billion people who are unbanked. Um, and whilst it's absolutely important to be getting money into the right hands and giving agency and choice as quickly as possible, today, tomorrow, every day, there's also we need to look at the fundamental system. And that, that's what Kiva Protocol does. And as you say, we'll come back to that in a second, but I wanted to touch on Kiva Capital because I think some of the people in the room and might be experiencing this um, transition or wanting to transition from maybe non-profit um, uh, capital into sort of more institutional capital. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting, you know, I hear a lot about if you build it, they will come, and that's really not been the case a lot with impact. It's been going to the investors and the financial institutions and saying, what is it you need, which is why I think it's very interesting, the thematic funds that you have. But is there any sort of advice you, you might have about sort of making that transition to institutional capital? I mean, I mean, to be honest, a lot of the groundwork and the hard work was done for that, like before I joined. So I, I got to turn up and get the glory of launching Kiva Capital. But the... Um, the thing that allowed us to launch it fast is, is having the track record. So we have you know, more than $1.4 billion of loans that we have granular person by person, month by month repayment data on. So we, can, we have a track record, so that's important. But it's the other thing that I, that I mentioned is that we can do these impact slices so we can go to a, um, a foundation or a, you know, a private sector and say, you know, we could, we could create a fund like this, or it could be a bit more like this, and we can kind of co-create, and we can craft impact and returns that meet their criteria. And I think that that's really been something quite unique. Yeah. Uh, I should also just say on Kiva Capital that we just paid back. Our first institutional funding came from OPIC, from David, who was just here, and we paid it back, I think, like yesterday or a couple of days ago. So I, I get to go to their drinks, which is exciting. <laughs> I hear yeah, they're but, good ones. But they were, OPIC, were, uh, <laughs> OPIC were really catalytic, and as they were talking about, they came in first to allow us to prove that we could put institutional capital to work. So we, we really appreciate that. Mm. And, and maybe that blended finance sort of helps 
sort of get you there towards, would, that, would you say that? For sure, yeah. yeah. And, and Skoll also um, participated in that and, and helped. So OPIC and Skoll have really helped us to sort of transform from a crowdfunding platform to having a more institutional track record that we can then go out and market. So you go from, so you've got 1.4 billion capital being moved in financial inclusion, which solves a, a hell of a lot of the SDGs, to be honest. Um, that's being expanded. Then you move into sort of the institutional money, bringing even more capital in, creating an asset class of financial inclusion, to be honest. And then that's not enough. It's time for a systems change, which I think we don't talk about enough, as I said before. So do you want to just talk a bit more in depth about what the protocol is and the work yeah. you're doing in Sierra Leone? So... Um Caveat, um, Kiva Protocol is a blockchain project, so some people may want to leave now. There's very mixed feelings <laughs> about it. Um, but I want to go back to where it came from, because it didn't start with a let's do a blockchain project. It turned out that that was the right technical solution for the problem. But it, it, it actually started out, I was in, I said, in the first few months when I was on this, on this world tour, I was out in rural Kenya, and I was just talking to people about their lives, and particularly about their financial lives. And, this, and a, a woman in Kenya was sort of walking me through how she got a cow loan and got some more loans and built this farm, and she got another loan and built this hardware store, and she'd been borrowing and repaying for 20 years, you know, $1,000 or so at a time, one-year loans, 30% you know, or so interest rate. I mean, many of you have un understand exactly how this works from various sources, including some Kiva sources. And, and, and I was saying, well, what's next? You know, what, you, you're, you're such an awesome entrepreneur. What, do, what are you going to do next? I said, well, I've, I've got this plot of land, and my dream is to build this house for my family, for three generations of my family on this land. I'm like, cool. So maybe I come back in a couple of years and get the house tour. And he's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm never going to build that house. You know, I've got the land, but the house will never get built. You know, it's like, not in my lifetime. I was like, wow, that's, that's terrible. Why, why is that? And, and she sort of explained, not in, the, not in these words, but she explained, like, all of my loans... Uh, have been, you know, we've been different providers, and they're not centralized and they're not recorded to be credit history. Like, I don't, have a, I don't have a credit rating, and I don't have an identity that it's all tied to. And I was like, huh. And, and as I was getting the, the plane back, I was like, but we have some identity for her, right? And we have, we have several million dollars people, several million people's identity and credit history on our servers in Silicon Valley Colo up the street and we just don't share them with anyone, right? And if you take our several hundred partners, they have hundreds of millions of identities and credit histories. So it's actually not that this isn't being recorded. It's not being recorded in the right format, and it's not being done in a way that can be shared. And we could move billions and billions of dollars, and it's not gonna change the fundamental situation of that woman, or many, many people like her, unless we get it recorded. And she's led this exemplary financial life. She has a much better credit risk than I am, I'm certain of that. And, and, and yet it just doesn't show up. She doesn't gain the benefit of that. And so we started to, so, so the thought experiment of how would we put our data and get others to put their data, and it's really about data, it's not about the money, the money will follow. And, and we're like, hmm. And, and so we started to just build technology to do this, and we built this prototype system, which had to have some characteristics of being very, very cheap digital identity. We had a real strong human rights view that it has to be self-sovereign identity, meaning we don't own it, the government doesn't own it, the person owns their identity. We had to be the data, the credit record, had to be separate from the identity because, you know, Equifax, that's not a good look. We don't want to do that. Um, you know, a whole bunch of things. We were like, well, how would we design the system? And we, and we came to this idea of doing this decentralized ledger system where identity could truly be owned by the individual, where the data is across a bunch of distributed databases, which we or no one else has access to, all of, all of this stuff. I said, okay, well, if we really want to do system change, real system change, how would we implement this? The, you know, the way to do it would be go to governments and get governments to adopt it for their entire population. That would be the single best way to do this, because if you do 70, 80 countries like this, you've, you've solved the whole problem. And so we said, well, you know, we probably need a country of between one to 10 million people, quite high financial exclusion, you know, blah, 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 a bunch of criteria. And we worked with UNDP and UNCDF to just go, go talk to central bankers and ministers of finance and, and so on. And um, at the UN General Assembly last year, actually much to our surprise, in some ways, the president of Sierra Leone stood up on stage and said, and so we're adopting Kiva Protocol as our national system. And we said, oh, wow, okay. Then I guess we have to actually build this. And, and we started, so we started building it in January, and just a, a month ago, the first Sierra Leonean, um, Nancy, fingerprinted in, and in less than three seconds performed an EKYC check to prove who she is. 
Um, and she'd previously been rejected by a bank six times. She didn't have the documents and so on. So the, the system's live in less than a year. By the end of this year, every Sierra Leonean, so 5.3 million adults, will have go in, fingerprint in, perform the KYC check, so basically full, full inclusion for everyone. And by the end of next year, we will have every MFI, bank, and credit union wired up into the system. So we'll have gone end-to-end -end in Sierra Leone in, in less than two years, which is also, importantly, less than, less than a presidential election term. So. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe we'll come back to that point in just a second, but it's, so it's not just Sierra Leone, you're working with another two countries and then there's a whole list of others that are on your radar. Yeah, yeah so Sierra Leone's read the test case. We wanted to you know, prove the tech works, prove that it's gonna get adopted, all of these, all of these things, but the, real, the goal of this is to roll this out to, to many, many countries. And it's, not, it, it's low level tech, right? Other people will build all kinds of applications on top of it. What we're aiming to provide is um, a format and open source low-level code for wallets and for a distributed ledger. And we work with the central bank, we work with the credit agency, if, if there is one, we work with the identity issuer to connect all this stuff in. Because that's the thing, most of this already exists. It's just not, it's not in the right format and it's not pulled together. So our kind of trick or our goal here is just to take what there is put it into very contemporary data formats and go really, really quickly so that the whole system gets stood up in one go, which, which I think is a bit of the trick. Yeah, and, and we don't have time to talk about it today, but obviously the importance of that, uh, of the Kiva protocol, as an increasing number of people are forced to leave their countries due to climate. Um, I mean, it's just invaluable, really, to have have that kind of technology that yeah. allows them to take the credit with them. And that's just for, for migration for, en for any reason. You know, once someone has this, you know, UN, TDF, whoever, uh, or uh, UNHCR can set up a fingerprint scanner on the other, en other end. The person can walk up, fingerprint in, pull up their identity and bring their financial history with them as well. And as, you know, clearly, as we all know, what we're seeing is, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, people becoming refugees for, for very long periods of time and being able to get identity and get there and bring their credit history with them, I think it's very transformational for being able to come you know, productive and integrated in the, in the next country. And I also want to give you, you kudos because um, you know, it's very daunting to think about systems change. We're going to go and work with the government, but you were really strategic about who you were partnering with around the timing of the elections. I don't know if we're running out of time, but if you can just mention that, because I think it's crucial to be strategic. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, have, we, we have a general operating thesis on this, that um, the, the, the timing, like when I say we can go end-to-end -end in a country in two years and bring every person, every financial system, uh, every financial institution into the system, I do think that timing point is critical. And when we're prioritizing countries, we particularly look for countries where, which has a new administration that's prioritizing financial inclusion and that has kind of tech, like some level of technical competency and so on. And, and actually, as we've done this scan, I think there's a lot of countries in the world that, that, that meet that criteria. Yeah. Great. Um, so, and I guess just to, to wrap up um, for the evening, is there anything sort of in particular that you would sort of draw on um, as being sort of advice to, to those who are sitting there thinking about how we can really move from like scale up impact in the biggest way towards system change? Are there any sort of key requirements that you've noticed? I mean, I guess personal reflections on, on what we do, at least I'm not you know, sure how applicable they are for others, but cer certainly reflections from the Kiva experience is one, I mean, the Kiva brand and track record, which others, others did way before I joined, it's been so critical to be viewed as sort of an honest broker in the space. So I think, you know, whether you have that directly or partnering with someone who has that, I really do think it's been... It, it would be inconceivable for me to do this outside of Kiva as a sort of a, a fresh thing. So I think that's really important as one. Um, in the second, ha just having, having, having for, for us, having that technology DNA has been really critical to this. I, I, my, I mean, my view is at least for some systems change, technology is really the key because if we were 5.3 million people, you can only really do that, at least at that, in that 
time frame with technology. So that's the second thing. And, and then the third thing is, for very large scale, governments are, I mean, our experience with the government of Sierra Leone has really been terrific. It, like, it really has. So it's kind of the, the conventional wisdom, at least around here, is like, avoid the government, avoid <laughs> the government. But like, our experience with OPIC has been terrific. Uh, domestically, our experience with the government of Sierra Leone has been terrific. So for me, that's actually like quite a new learning about how do you, how do you both be truly mission-oriented, move fast with technology, but also partner with governments. I think if you can get all of those things together, huge change is possible. And you've done it in such a short time as well. So thank you so much. It's been great. And we can give another round of applause. Thanks. Thank you.